one. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Meet Our Leaders series. I am Sam Loney and I'm coming to you live from Melbourne, Australia, where it is a warm summer evening. Welcome to our audience from around the world and our dear guest, the Executive Secretary of UN Climate Change, Ms. Patricia Spinoza, who is coming to you live from Bonn, Germany. Secretary, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today uh, here in Bonn. It's actually a cold and snowy day. And uh, I'm very glad to, to say hello also to all the people that are joining us online, online. I want to thank you also for the work that you do in the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and uh, for hosting this webinar. So um, as an introduction, I would like to, to start with a few uh, remarks because today we stand at a crossroads. This is a big moment for the planet, for humanity, and especially for every young person who wants a better future for themselves and their families. The path we decide to take in this moment will shape the future of human development. And we have never had more compelling and concrete reasons to choose the path of sustainability, equality, and social and environmental responsibility. In this moment, the challenge of climate change is clear. The impacts are real and undeniable. 2017 was a climate disaster. We saw monsoon flooding across Asia and extreme storms hit Caribbean islands and North America. It was one of the most expensive years for climate-related disasters ever. 2017 was also the second hottest year on record and the hottest year without El Nino, which drives warming. Extreme cold in the US and extreme heat in Australia, where you are, Ben, already this year, show that our world is changing before our eyes. These extremes may well be our new normal. The human and economic costs are immense and they are especially painful for young people. Climate impacts take young people out of school, take away the ability to get started on a career and can disrupt a stable, secure home. For many young people, climate change has long lasting impacts impacts that young people often have trouble recovering from. For instance, when monsoon flooding hit Mumbai, India, it damaged around 18,000 schools, which means almost 2 million children missed their classes. That is a lasting impact. And it is not just about extreme weather. Look at the Sahel in Africa, just south of the Sahara, which has seen persistent drought. Climate change makes it harder and harder to grow crops, find enough water, find work and raise a family. One heat wave or late rainy season pulls more and more families into a poverty trap. This poverty trap is a downward spiral, often starting with crop failure and food and income shortfalls. Then, Children are pulled out of school to help provide for the family. And when food becomes scarce, women and children are often the first to sacrifice their meals so those who work have enough. <clears throat> Sometimes men and boys migrate away in search of food and jobs so they can buy food to send home. Climate change is literally tearing families apart and you can draw a direct line between the reality of climate impacts that young people face and healthy, sustainable development. Look at the sustainable development goals. Goal number one is zero poverty. Number two is zero hunger. Number three is good health and well-being. Clean air and water, access to education, energy and economic opportunity all are impacted by climate change. When young people are adversely affected, 
and hurt by climate change, it is felt across all aspects of development. It is not just one person who loses their opportunity for a better future. It is the entire community, sometimes the entire country. This is why implementation of the Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals is so important and why this is a crossroads moment. Governments have put, have put these agreements in place. The signal has been sent. And we are, as one global community and with the help of institutions like SDSN, working towards a stable, secure future, where opportunities open to all and healthy communities thrive on a healthy planet. It sounds great, and in many ways it is, but the reality is that governments alone cannot choose the path we take. It is up to all of us to determine the path forward, and the voice of young people is especially important right now. In many ways, the crossroads moment is your moment. Without action by all, we will not achieve the goals laid out in the Paris Agreement and Agenda for Sustainable Development. Fortunately, this is also a moment where more climate solutions are available than ever before. That is what all young people should understand about climate change. There are so many solutions out there. Look, we have more scientific knowledge than ever before. This gives us a deep understanding of how human development affects the planet. And science also gives us the technology and tools to avert disaster. We will soon see a lot more electric vehicles on the road, smarter buildings, more clean renewable energy, more flights flown on biofuels, more innovative and green financial models, more advances in energy storage and more efficient consumption. And for good reason, electric vehicles cut costs and are fun to drive. Smart buildings save money. Battery backups are providing they can keep grids steady if power generation cuts up, out. Clean energy provides stable investment returns, millions of green jobs, and it opens entrepreneurial opportunity. The benefits of climate action are immense and growing every day. Climate action is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. So what we need right now in this moment are the ideas, innovation and energy that bring these solutions to all countries, all markets and all people around the world. We need action by all and especially action by you. So today I ask you to take action. I ask you to take personal action. You hold great power in the choices you make. From your choices of what to eat, what to wear, what to buy, to the choice to be here today and learn about this issue, almost every personal choice you can be, you can make and be climate smart. I also ask you to take political action. Be active and engaged, vote, support politicians that understand the grave risk of climate change. Stand up for what you believe in and empower others to do the same. Then I ask you all to share what you are doing with your friends and family, with those who are younger than you, with the companies you support and the schools you attend. Everybody has to know that climate change is one of the greatest challenges we have ever faced that we have the solutions at hand, and that it is up to us to choose the path towards a better future. There is no one better to be the voice of change than young people who will live in this world long after my generation is gone. UN Climate Change will help your voice be heard at our annual conference online and across the world.
We stand at the crossroads. Now is your moment. Let's work together to lead the world down the right path. So thank you. These are my introductory remarks. Now I am uh, I will be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much for those in introductory comments, Ms. Espinosa, uh, outlining the, the impacts of climate change and the, the, what is at stake here, but also the role that young people can play in it and the, the, the importance of that role and what pathways we have going forward with all the various solutions that are at our stake. And this sort of brings me to the, the, the work of uh, UN Climate Change, uh, previously known as the UNFCCC, um, and also your role within it. So before your work at um, UN Climate Change, you were the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Mexico from 2006 to 2012, uh, with 30 years of experience in international relations. Um, you also uh, had served on uh, multiple multilateral bodies and international organizations, whether it's in Vienna, Geneva, New York. You were the chair of uh, COP16, which actually led to the adoption of the Cancun agreements. And um, you were also part of the UN high-level panel of eminent person on post-2015 development agenda. So it seems that you've been a tireless supporter of multilateralism and you've been doing uh, a whole lot um, looking at the work of uh, Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and before, I guess, uh, before all this, my, my, my question is, uh, what, when you were young, did you ever look and think, this is my future? Did you ever imagine that you would have such a future in these leadership roles and doing, doing what matters and being able to uh, head one of the most important organizations in the world? Well, I have to say, um, I, uh, I didn't think when I was young that I could uh, achieve uh, such a high position. To, uh, to me, uh, being here today and having the opportunity to um, be uh, conducting the Secretariat on Climate Change uh, is a great privilege. And um, I'm, I'm really uh, thankful for, for the trust that so many people have put in me. Um, it is an opportunity to contribute. And when I look around and see other people of my age uh, that I have known all my life and they are preparing themselves to retire, so I feel double as much as privilege to, to be able to have this opportunity. So it was not exactly what I was uh, really aiming for. But what I can tell you is that I was uh, always uh, dedicated and devoted to trying to make a contribution for um, enhancing the opportunities for the people of Mexico, because in, in my uh, diplomatic career, I worked over uh, 30 years serving uh, the government of Mexico. And um, it became very clear to me that the challenges that the country faced uh, had, to, had a very direct uh, relationship with what was happening beyond our borders. Climate change is one of the issues that most clearly uh, really uh, make a case of the need to look beyond borders, of the need to really uh, have a global vision in order to address challenges that affect people uh, in their everyday life in all parts of the planet. So um, I think um, I've, been, I've been really blessed and lucky, and I'm humbled by this opportunity. Uh, but um, my um, take uh, on this is that um, if you uh, are dedicated, if you really believe in uh, uh, things uh, uh, that you uh, try to contribute to, uh, you can make a big uh, contribution. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and now you're in this uh, very important leadership role at, at a very important time in, in human history, uh, doing this very important work. Uh, you know, uh, and you mentioned climate change goes beyond borders. And I guess that's part of the work is, is that the, the multilateralism of trying to bring uh, governments together to tackle this common issue. And so how does the UNFCCC or UN climate change uh, do that? What, 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 is, what is the main objective of the organization and how does it do its work? Okay, well, Sam, as you know, uh, this organization uh, was established uh, in the convention, uh, framework convention of the United Nations uh, on climate change. So our, our role, according to the convention, is to make a follow-up of all the decisions that the parties to the convention take um, regarding the uh, commitments that they undertake under the convention. And the convention basically expresses the, the will, the political will of all the parties to contribute towards um, a fighting against climate change, to contribute towards a, a world where climate change is not, is, is not a big problem, where we can avoid the worst um, effect of climate change. So um, within this process, since the convention was uh, adopted and entered into force in 1994, um, there have been several phases and uh, uh, that have uh, that culminated in 2015 with the Paris Agreement, where all the countries uh, under the Paris Agreement put on the table a set of commitments in order to uh, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And also in many of those programs, countries included uh, adaptation programs because uh, the countries around the world have such a diverse realities that uh, for some, the biggest issue has to do with uh, reducing emissions. For others, adaptation is also a very important element in order to protect the livelihoods and the lives of people. Uh, this is especially true of the smaller, uh, most vulnerable developing countries. So what we are doing in the process is to uh, generate the platform for the parties to come together, to talk to each other, to exchange their views on different issues, and also to generate a framework that, that allows us to make an assessment of how much progress we are doing in uh, as an international community in combating climate change. This is in, in very general terms what we are doing here in at the UN Climate Change Secretariat. That's wonderful and thank you for that overview. I think it really helps uh, the audience and young people around the world understand the work of the, of the UNFCCC uh, but in particular, I think a lot of young people are also interested in, in, in your role within this uh, as the executive secretary of the Climate Change Secretariat. Uh, what, 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 is an, what does an average day look like? I imagine a lot of meetings and tough negotiations. And I guess we, uh, I want to uh, give the audience an, an understanding of what this leadership role involves and, and uh, what, it, what it is that you do on on a daily basis in terms of your main work? Well, let's, let's take the example uh, of today. The, this, at this moment, what are the priorities? What are my main tasks in my, everyday, in my everyday work? As you know, this year we will have a very intense year in terms of negotiations because by uh, the COP in Poland, we need to uh, finalize the Paris Agreement work program, which is the rules and uh, directives and uh, uh, objectives uh, of the, the operating manual for the Paris Agreement. That means that we will have this year three sessions of negotiations that should allow us to finalize that, uh, those, that operating manual, let's say, which in the process we know as the Paris Agreement work program. So one part of my work is to try to guide the process within the Secretariat so that 
we in the Secretariat are able to support the different processes of negotiations that need to take place. Um, and uh, this, this requires that we have internally a lot of uh, coordination and communication because we are talking here about negotiations that have to do with all different issues that are addressed in various parts of the house. It has to do with adaptation, it has to do with mitigation, it has to do with capacity building, with financing. So we need to, uh, we have been working very hard, by the way, in putting in place a good structure so that we are able to support the parties in those negotiations um, and uh, facilitate them coming together and getting to commitments and uh, agreements. On the other hand, because we are now really in the phase of implementation of the Paris Agreement, we also need to engage with non-party stakeholders, with business, with a civil society, with think tanks, with all a lot of uh, leaders that are really very active uh, everywhere in the world in trying to uh, get the message through that addressing climate change and uh, is really um, in the center of development and is also the smart thing to do, as I was mentioning before. So uh, another part of my work has to do with reaching out to all those uh, non-party stakeholders. And this is why, for instance, why I went to uh, the meeting in Davos uh, now in, uh, in January, uh, where the World Economic Forum put forward um, a survey uh, where from the five highest risks that were identified by the business community, business and investors community, four of them are climate related. So um, what uh, we need to do is make this linkage between the process, the intergovernmental process, the commitments that countries are taking, and the world of uh, investors, the world of um, business, the world of civil society, so that everybody really gets on board in order to make progress in this, uh, in this process. Uh, thank you for that. And um, you, you mentioned the, the importance of stakeholder engagement. Uh, I mean, in particular, I know COP is the, the most important meeting point. It's where the Paris Agreement was negotiated. Um, and I guess a lot of young people watching this webinar will be wondering, what is the mechanism? What is a, uh, what is a way for them to be able to engage with this process, to have their voices heard within, the, uh, within COP and within the, the UN system uh, more generally? Well, we have... Uh, a different um, vehicles for uh, involvement of uh, young people. We have, uh, for instance, uh, one of our constituencies is Yongo, which is um, a, a group uh, that uh, has been participating since 2009 in the conferences uh, in, the, in the climate change negotiations, and they have been given the opportunity to make inputs to address uh, the conferences. Uh, we have also uh, seen since um, uh, COP11 uh, uh, what is called the COI, the Conference of Youth, that takes place a couple of days before we start the conference. And uh, I have had a, really an opportunity to be uh, at, the, at the Conference of, of Youth uh, in the last two years in Morocco and also here in Bonn. And I can tell you that it's incredibly exciting, the amount of young people that come together from different parts of the world. Uh, for instance, in um, Bonn, there was a very big conference, a very big uh, COI, and where uh, 140 countries uh, were represented. And it was amazing, the, the commitment and the inputs that th these young people uh, gave to, to the parties. Um, we also have other uh, processes that uh, are intended to involve youth, like the Global Youth Video Competition, 
um, which is uh, a competition that takes place every every year since 2005. And uh, you can look at some of those videos in our website. Some of them are really amazing. So uh, I encourage every everybody, all young people, to to participate and to bring in their inputs. But uh, beyond these moments of engagement directly in the conference, uh, what I would like to stress is that is what is most important is that young people are active in their communities. As I was mentioning before, that they become involved in, uh, in if they don't want to become politicians, it's fine, but they still become active in the decisions, in the political decisions that are taken in their countries, that they go to vote, that they try to uh, hold politicians accountable for the goals regarding sustainability and addressing climate change. And well, hopefully also some of them will, will uh, be uh, inclined to become politicians and to, and to take this as one of their uh, big uh, agendas uh, in their, in their uh, political career. So the change, the most important change has to take place in the communities. No, absolutely. And, and, and I guess that sort of bring, brings me to the topic of the low emission development strategies. Um, so what are the low emission development strategies and how could young people get involved in their uh, creation and also in their implementation? Well, um, you know, uh, the Paris Agreement has uh, requested countries to present uh, low emissions development strategies um, in, in leading up to 2050. And this is important because uh, when we are talking about addressing uh, climate change and a sustainability agenda, we need to talk about, we need to have a, a, a longer term vision. It's not uh, a change that we are going to see from today until tomorrow. It's a longer term vision. So this is why these uh, low emissions development strategies are very, very uh, important. Now, youth can get, get involved uh, by being active in their communities. And uh, in their communities, uh, there, there can be, uh, you know, uh, activities starting from where they are, in the family, at school, at universities, in community work, getting involved in community work, so that uh, as part of society, the uh, requirement to their authorities to build up this longer term vision and uh, these uh, low emission development strategies becomes really absolutely necessary because uh, all politicians need to address what their constituencies are asking for. Otherwise, they will not get, get uh, uh, elected. So it is very important that young people become active in this regard uh, today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And um, I also want to ask your opinion on the role that young people can play, in particular also in social entrepreneurship, in helping scale up some of the solutions, um, in particular in, uh, with renewable energy. Um, and a, a lot, I know a lot of young people have drawn inspiration from the work of individuals such as uh, Elon Musk. Um, and I want to think, what, what, what do you think about that? Uh, what, what do you think the significance of social entrepreneurship is? And how can we, um, as uh, you know, uh, within the UN system, but also uh, in civil society, help capitalize on that to be able to support young people, scare some of their solutions? Well, um, let, let me say that uh, we have seen in, in our process uh, through our um, Momentum for Change initiative that intends to, to highlight uh, some of the innovative and uh, very valuable contributions. We have seen the creativity of young people and this uh, 
uh, entrepreneurship um, uh, spirit um, that has has brought of them really uh, very um, make them very successful. Youth know the needs of their communities, and they also have uh, they are creative. On on top of that, youth today are able to access um, a lot of information through internet, through social media. So they have the possibility of exchanging ideas and getting inputs from all over the world, basically every day. So what we have seen is that some of these uh, young uh, people have come up with very, very creative ideas and are really making um, a contribution. I can think, for instance, of a group of young people in, um, I believe it was in, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, that, were, uh, that were recognized by the Momentum for Change Awards because they, they were um, uh, able to give, um, uh, to install solar panels uh, on trees and on the top of on the roof of some of the um, of the you know very poor houses, and that brought uh, electricity to those to those communities. I can think also about um, another example, very recent example of a, a small group of young people in Italy who uh, built. Um, a company, they developed a, a fashion um, a company um, and they collected uh, materials that uh, were not used by the big uh, companies and with that they developed their own uh, uh, fashion collection. And um, as you know, the textile industry is a, a, one of the industries that really uh, creates a big problem of pollution. So um, they have made an enormous contribution. In addition to that, what they decided to do is to employ women in vulnerable situations. So there's a lot of um, a, a, really win-win uh, situations that we can see from these kind of, of uh, projects that are basically created by young people. Thank you. Thank you so much and for highlighting those examples and knowing about them. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear it also from you. And I understand that we, we have to wrap up the meeting because you, you, you have a very packed schedule uh, with, with, uh, with, with lots of very tough negotiations ahead. But I want one last final request from you, which is uh, if you had, uh, let's say, 60 seconds and imagine that you were speaking to a class of 17 year olds who by the time uh, that is 2030, they will be 30 years old. What is the advice you would give to them uh, to prepare themselves for the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead, to make an impact in their career and also in their lifestyles? Well, I, I, I think I would tell them, uh, first of all, to be, to be confident, to remain optimistic about their creativity, their possibilities to really find solutions for their future, not to become pessimistic. They have to stay optimistic about it. And the second point I would make is in every decision you take every day, think about the environmental um, uh, impact that you and that your action is doing. If you are going to school, are you going uh, by foot? Are you going by car? Are you going by bus? Are you going by bicycle? If you are going to buy something, uh, what does it uh, imply in terms of environmental impact? If you are going to eat something, what is this going to imply in terms of environmental impact? If you got some savings, where are you going to put your savings? What is that a financial institution doing with your money? I would advise them to do that. Wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for, for your comments. And I'm sure a lot of young people around the world will draw inspiration from
from from your from your leadership as as a, a, a young woman who went through the, the the various ranks within the global world of diplomacy and now leads one uh, one of the most important organizations in the world. And thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. And with that, I also want to say this uh, the Meet Our Leaders series is a is, is a series. Um, organized by SDSN Youth and the SDG Academy, and that uh, if young people are interested in contributing to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals and the work of the Paris Agreement, uh, please simply visit our uh, website, sdsnyouth.org. And if you're interested to do online courses and learn more about climate change and uh, climate policy and the impact of these negotiations, you can simply go to sdgacademy.org. Uh, so one final thank you, Mrs. Spinoza, for joining us today and speaking to young people from all over the world. And with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you, so, Sam. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for joining us. So please like, comment, and share. Uh, until next time, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening.